sometimes you might use a tool, something similar to this. Now, this is a lot like what you would uh, use to turn off the water in your front yard or something like that. So you can actually take something like this. I know it's a little dark, but basically what happened is I took out every other screw and I attached it to this tool. This tool is about $100, but you probably can find a couple of different ways to do this. But, uh, but basically, I'm going to force either to, if a head is stuck to the platter, I'll force it by turning it. If there's a problem with the bearings or something, sometimes pushing down, pulling up, and turning a little bit will solve this problem. Sometimes even just, you know, you have to be careful you're going to stick a screwdriver in there because if it slips, you just, you know, scourge your platter and it's over. But there's other ways to deal with uh, something like this that's a problem. So this is the bottom of the drive. And you can't get to the motor. The, this, this does not remove the motor. This isn't going to come out. It's part of the casing and the cap stand. It looks a lot like this. So it's actually part of the whole device. <coughs> so it's, it's not something that you're going to just be able to like pop right through and deal with it and take out a motor and replace it and you know your platter still be aligned. You have a problem if you have to remove those platters. And if you have to take platters out to move them to another drive, if they are turned at all, they will not work again at all. They need to be aligned perfectly, so you have to remove them all at once. So it's a lot easier if you can deal with the motor before you actually go this far. So let's say that I take this. Now, the big thing here to watch is your spacing. So your spacing for this copper, the whole point is, is I'm going to do a trick. I'm going to take a Dremel or a drill, and I'm going to come through the bottom of the motor, and then I'm going to lubricate it. And the whole point is not to puncture it so you hit this copper. If you hit any of this, it's over. Or if you get metal and stuff stuck in there, you probably won't be able to get it back out again. So in this case, I use a really small drill, and I drilled a hole that just barely punctures the metal. And as soon as I've done this, now if you use a Dremel or something, you might be able to like sand it down until you get there. I've used it a couple different ways. It just takes a lot longer to do it with the Dremel. But, uh, so I know the alignment. When I'm holding the drive, I know where each of, these <coughs> each of these breaks are. So I have a pretty good idea where I can puncture it and not hit copper. So you might want to look at another drive before you do this. And then I literally can put WD-40 or oil in there. Don't put much of it. Put a drop or two because it comes on, sometimes it can come out the other side and come out around the cap stands and then get on the platter and then it ruins your heads and so on and so on. But you can put a drop or something in here and then the motor will actually come up and spin. So uh, one of the other things too, if a motor does not work, and you cannot figure out if you've already gone through this, you've already dealt with a PCB board, you don't get firmware, you, you know, play with the motor, the motor's spinning fine, you, you, know, you turn it and it moves just perfectly fine. Uh, one thing you want to know is, is it my board that's a problem because the drive's not spinning up, or is it uh, you know, something else that's a problem? So is it the motor maybe? Maybe there's actually something wrong with the motor in that even though it turns fine, the motor still won't power up correctly. So you can take another board, you can take another drive, the exact same drive, or not even the exact same drive, just the same shape of the board itself. And over here, you'll actually see this spot. This is the spot that the connect connector to the head assembly touches. This part right here that actually touches the motor is the same on pretty much all the drives. Uh, so if you've got a 5400 RPM, you got, they're pretty much the same as long as they line up in some fashion. What you want to do is you want to cover this. You want to cover this with a piece of paper or a label or something so that it does not make contact if you do not have the same board. But you want to find out your motor's working. All you have to do is cover this, screw it back on, and then turn the power on and see if the motor actually spins. Most of the time that will work. There are some SCSI drives that have delay sets and stuff like that that it won't work on, but for uh, IDE drives, SATA drives, things like that, you can tell whether or not the motor will spin. In a lot of cases then you know you have a problem with your PCB board if it spins with the other board on, but doesn't spin with the bad board. So you'll know you'll be looking at some sort of a PCB port problem. This is basically what it looks like where the pins actually come through. All you have to do is cover that up. So you take the four screws off. You just want to make sure whatever board is connecting. And then sometimes I actually end up actually hardwiring it to another board. Now this one, the boards didn't match. So I actually hardwired the motor to another board. And then I actually used the regular board and put it back on and ran the drive, ignoring the motor. And that one worked. So. If it's more complicated than that, if you can't solve it with any of those things, then you're actually at a spot where you're moving the platters to another drive. This is another talk that I did on how to actually do that, but there's a special tool that you actually need to do that. This is $600. So you end up with a situation where it might be something that you got stopped, that you couldn't do anything with. There's uh, other methods maybe, but this is the best and the most secure if you end up having to move platters. So, uh, so we've kind of gone through the basics of these components right here, phasers. The chips, the electronics are burnt, does it smell? Uh, and then some of the others are going to end up being, well, what if the motor is spinning? 
does it sound correct? Does it spin at the appropriate speed? You can usually tell if you're getting a motor that spins at the appropriate speed. If it doesn't spin at the right speed, the head is not floating as high over the platters as it needs to be. So it might actually lock down or it might scratch the platters. <coughs> so let's talk about scraping sounds for a second. That sounds beautiful, doesn't it? Yep. If you make a mistake and you don't assess the problem correctly, you could end up with this situation where you actually created the situation, and that's what it will look like. This whole outer edge will be scraped off, and this will become platter dust. Or in a situation like this. This is actually two platters. This is an IBM drive. They are glass ceramic platters, and you can see through both platters. This piece of paper is stuck below the bottom platter, and the heads have scraped off so much of the material you can see through the glass and that you can actually see the pink below it on the bottom. What's that? Yeah, it's beautiful. It is beautiful. It becomes more artful when you take off the lid. <coughs> this is the lid. And there's so much platter dust from some of these drives that actually comes off. It actually made an impression just from pushing the airflow back up with the dust that you can actually see the whole assembly. I mean, this is actually a beautiful piece of art. So you might want to frame it or something. A lot of people will ask too, though, what if, uh, what if, you know, it's not obvious. What if it's not on the top of the platter and I can't see it? How do I know if a lower platter is scratched? In a lot of cases, this is a filter. On the side, on the edge of a drive, there would be a filter, like here. If a lower platter is scratched, in a lot of cases, this filter will look silver. It's supposed to be white. It's not white. It's silver. That's white. This is silver. It's a little yellow, actually, probably from this. But uh, so ultimately, if you have a scratch on a lower platter, that will be what your indication is. That's usually a good thing about, hey, I don't want to buy a donor drive. I don't want to spend another $200 on a drive that's not going to work and I can't get parts from. So that's usually a, a good sign there. There's a way to check this, though, to see if you've got platter dust or something is scratched ahead of time. So on the side of a drive, you guys recognize this? You guys seen this before? So there's a, this is basically, I believe this is all used at manufacturing time for head alignments and stuff like that. They can insert a tool and do the whole thing, and then they cover it up, and it says warranty void if you mess with me. So, uh, so basically, this piece of silver right here, if you peel it back, you'll notice uh, these are the platters. This still can maintain pretty good air from a standpoint of not having to have a clean room or something like that, and you might be able to tell fairly easily whether or not you've got a scratch. It's not 100% all the time. I've seen scratches where the platter dust doesn't show up on the label. But if you do have platter dust right away, you know I'm um, pretty much probably done for, depending on the amount of damage. So this is a silver one. You can actually see the silver, and it looks good. This is one that the circle is all black. And so here's another picture of it. So the circle is actually black, and you have their silver outline on it. So that's pretty bad from that standpoint. That's probably going to be pretty close to the end of that drive. Uh, and you can tell that at least without having to go to a clean room or something else to open it. So that's kind of the basic breakdown of uh, uh, this drive's been through a fire. So uh, the big problem with drives that go through a fire is that you can't read the label in a lot of cases. So you don't know what the parts are that you need to buy. So that's your biggest problem. But, uh, but ultimately, that's kind of my breakdown of the flow chart that I actually showed for all the stuff of how to step through it and do the basics. Anybody got any questions? Back up, back up, back up. Put me out of business. I'm all right. So couldn't we get something better than hard drives? 2015, maybe. Uh, well, temporarily, we'll have solid state drives along the way. They have their own sets of problems. And they have a lot of the TVS problems. The problems with the, a lot of solid state and USB memory sticks have the same TVS problem. They're just a lot smaller. So those, they're hard to find. Like SAM, uh, SanDisk uh, USB memory sticks have like five on them. You have to break off all five of them, and they'll work. They'll, the USB memory stick will work fine, and other solid state disks have the same kind of problem. Uh, but there's something called uh, domain memory, domain walls, and uh, it's being designed by the same guy who actually manufactured and designed the original head that we actually use on our heads right now. Uh, he works for a branch of uh, IBM, Palo Alto or something, uh, and it's basically a solid piece of metal that pulses are stored in that can be read back at a faster speed than you can read with hard drives. He's already got a prototype running and expect maybe 2015 or so we'll might. And it might actually get to a spot where we no longer actually have a drive that the case of our computer